All right, welcome everybody. I'm here with uh, my dad, Dr. Wally Goddard, and we're super excited to share with you a couple of um, uh, my dad's research and um, just life experience about the path to happiness. Um, so um, just by way of introduction, my dad has uh, spent his whole career um, and his whole life being happy. So what more credentials do you need, right? Yeah. As a kid, I remember um, my, uh, a lot of our relatives nicknamed my dad Guy Smiley. So, you know, if, if you've seen, uh, I don't know if you watch Sesame Street in uh, Australia, but um, that's one of the best characters on the show is Guy Smiley. So um, my dad is actually a really um, committed learner and researcher and has spent most of his career uh, studying positive psychology and how to apply that uh, not only in your personal uh, development, but also uh, in your marriage and your family. So we're, we're really excited to, to hear from him tonight. And, um, and just to create a space for you to uh, up level your, your happiness. So um, my dad is a PhD in marriage and family development. Uh, and he's one of the, the America's le uh, leading experts on marriage and family. Uh, he's developed award-winning programs and um, written best-selling books. Uh, he, he's partnered with um, Heim Gnat's widow and, and updated the classic Between Parent and Child. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and turn the time over to Dr. Wally Goddard. Thanks, son. And I think all of you know Andy, he's a very good model of uh, happiness and uh, He's one of the sources of our happiness, too. We're very <laughs> grateful to, to Andy. And uh, hope that what we do today can be useful to you. So um, I think a, a good place to start is to introduce you maybe to a, a, a program we developed in Arkansas. We tried to summarize the research on well-being, and we created a 12-page booklet that uh, lists five principles that are at the heart of, um, of happiness and well-being. And uh, it draws on the whole the whole field of research on happiness. And uh, we've tried to, to summarize that in just five, five principles. So um, Andy, should we uh, look at the PowerPoint? Yeah. And, and this handout, by the way, is a free download. Um, we'll be posting it on the Share Success website. So uh, don't worry about where you can buy it or find it. It'll, it'll be a free download. We'll, we'll share the URL at the end. So uh, let's go ahead and start sharing the screen. Okay, if I go to that, where did I go? Slide. Okay, great. Can, can you guys see my screen? Give me a thumbs up if you can. See the PowerPoint? Okay, Santoshi's giving us a yep. All right. Okay, great. So um, five principles for building a better life. I think that a good place to start is, um, do we do that, Andy? Is to ask why happiness, does it matter? Is it like the sunroof in your car that in some ways is a, is a nice feature and something that makes your car more enjoyable, but also adds a lot of heat in the summer and uh, can make you miserable? And in other words, is happiness one of those things that's kind of pleasant, but it also irritates your friends that you're also always so cheerful? Um, is it just kind of a mixed blessing or is happiness more like your motor oil? the kind of thing that um, makes your car function. Without the motor oil, nothing really works. Nothing moves, nothing works well. Um, so there's the question, happiness. Is it just a kind of a nice feature or is it essential? And I, I guess your experience might, be, might uh, vary, but um, my sense is that it's both. It's both of those. It is a nice feature it uh, admits more light and, uh, and lightness into our lives. It also is essential for functioning. For instance, one of the uh, great findings by Barbara Fredrickson is that uh, happy people, positive people, tend to be more creative and more productive. Um, they, there's something about that happiness that opens people to life and opens them to others that's uh, very important. So uh, why happiness? But here's, here's a key question. And I don't know if you want to 
answer in, in a response box or maybe make a maybe make some notes as we talk today this evening whatever I, what time is it there it's I guess morning, time. morning sorry it's evening for us um, so you guys are always so far ahead of us um, so um, how would you rate your level of happiness or maybe more importantly how would the people who know you rate your characteristic level of happiness would they say that is kind of a mixed thing or you're a grouch or would they say that you're cheerful uh, what would people say about your level of happiness? Um, maybe you make kind of a mental note or um, or put something in the chat box. Because um, noticing how other people feel about you and your happiness uh, can give you an idea of, of how you're functioning in life. And sometimes we, um, we think we're pretty happy, but um, other people don't experience us that way. Well, um, so with that in mind, let's talk about the um, five keys to, um, to happiness uh, with this as context. That's Martin Seligman. Martin Seligman was the past president of the American Psychological Association in 1998. He challenged the psychologists of the world as, a, as the president of the organization. He said, look, you guys, for all these years, we have studied sickness and we have a lot of wonderful, amazing cures uh, or at least management techniques for mental sickness, but we haven't really developed thriving, flourishing, and well-being, and we should. We should help people figure out how to make the best of their lives. So we set off that challenge in 1998 to the psychologists of the world, but as he himself observes, he hadn't quite mastered it himself. He says that he himself has a pretty gloomy disposition. And he tells the story of one day when he was working in the yard uh, with his daughter, Nikki. And he's a very serious gardener. And so he was very systematically digging out the weeds by their roots and, and setting them aside. Nikki, in contrast, his five-year-old was pulling up the weeds and throwing them in the air and dancing and carrying on and making quite a production out of these weeds. This, of course, um, irritated Seligman, who uh, chewed her out and said, let's get serious about this. Let's get this weeding done. And, um, and her response, Nikki's response, and imagine a five-year-old saying this. Nikki said, Daddy, I want to talk with you. From the time I was three until I was five, I whined a lot. But I decided the day I turned five to stop whining, and I have not whined once since the day I turned five. Daddy, if I can stop whining, you can stop being such a grouch. Um, yeah, there's the, there's the key to all of this is that um, we can make decisions that change how we function. We can become more happy if we make the right decisions. Now, one of the problems is um, if we make the wrong decisions, it could get a lot worse. If we make the right decisions, it can get a lot better. So what, um, what we want to share with you today are, are some of those discoveries of science that tell us what are the things that matter, what are the things that um, really make a difference in our well-being. So the first one, um, the first one is to notice and appreciate the good in each and every day. Notice and appreciate the good. Um, so if, if I were to ask you, what have you enjoyed today? What today has just felt good? I mean, even, even though it may be um, morning time there, um, what, what have you already enjoyed today that you thought, wow, that was good? What have you savored? Don't you love that word savor? It's kind of like when you're eating something you absolutely love and you decide that uh, you're going to just stop and savor it and enjoy the, the flavors. Well, have you enjoyed the flavors of life today? Have you savored? Um, I, I don't know that we have a good way of having everyone share that, do we, Andy? Yeah, if you want to maybe just make a comment in the chat box and let's, um, let's hear some of the things that you've, uh, you've been savoring so far today. Ooh, 
Paul <clears throat> got woke up by kisses and a smile from his wife. <laughs> wow, bliss is right. Doesn't get any better than that, gentlemen. <laughs> oh, man. So she's been in Europe and he's been at home in, in Africa. So. <clears throat> And Judith, the great morning, a meeting with like-minded women. Why sharing with people who, who um, you really have, feel a kinship with. Coffee, catch up, and some Christmas shopping with a girlfriend without kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a blessing to have them and a blessing to be without them at times, isn't it? <laughs> great morning, a meeting. Um, Let's see, be able to listen to this in live. Great, glad you're here, Christine. Um, good. Gorgeous sunny day in Perth. Baby kittens in my garden, wow. We should be meeting in Perth, shouldn't we? No kidding. <laughs> A walk and healthy breakfast. Great, excellent examples. So noticing and appreciating the good in every day, um, each and every day. You know what's um, funny is, I don't know if you have this experience. Last night, I went to bed with Nancy, and I, I love hugging Nancy. But sometimes um, sometimes a combination of aches and pains and overactive mind means I don't get to sleep very readily. So last night, about 11.30, I gave up and got up and uh, went in our living room and sat in a comfortable chair. And I had done, as I always do, I, I always make, um, oh, where did I put it? My, oh, there it is. Do they see us in the box? So I um, I keep this this little book in which I write every single day. I write some of the things that went well. Every day before I go to bed, I write uh, at least two or three things that went well. And so yesterday I had written down, let me see how many. Um, I've written four things that went well. And um, then as I said, I, I couldn't get to sleep. So I got up and... Um, sat in a comfortable chair and I started doing a review of the day and and you know when you're tired and it's the end of the day and you wish you were sleeping it's easy to let anxiety start talking and start thinking oh man what about this and what about that and is this going to work out and um and and I <laughs> I know enough about this to know when I'm being stupid and um it doesn't keep me from being stupid it just makes me aware of it when I am so uh, as I sat in that comfortable chair, I said, uh, Wally, let's do a deeper review of the day. And I started ticking through the events of the day. And I went from uh, four went wells up to uh, 15. 15 went wells. 15 things I thought, even for instance, one of them was um, my uh, desktop computer broke down yesterday. And I thought, <laughs> as I reviewed the day, I thought, I am learning so much from this doggone computer. And um, it wasn't what I preferred, but I felt like it was a good lesson for me to try about a dozen things to try to get it to work. And um, I finally surrendered and took it to the, took it to the repair person. Um, but that's, that's at the heart of this is um, enjoying each, each day, each day's events. So um, I recommend and and, and incidentally, Science research recommends this as the fundamental practice for well-being. If you want to be happy, keep a regular record of what's going well in your life, your went wells. Keeping that record each and every day is one of the best things you can do. Um, Andy, you want to add anything to that? You want to say anything about that? Um, yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, in, uh, in our field of personal development, uh, and in doTERRA, um, you've probably noticed that <clears throat> in all the mentoring forms that, that we've created in the Share Success System, uh, the first question is, um, what's going well, right? What, what are the things that, wh where are you finding success? And so just grounding every conversation in the positive is such a simple but powerful thing. Um, there's a, a famous Disney movie called Pollyanna that I'd love to hate for several years. Um, <laughs> just something about her positive, cheery, you know, you just want just to slash it. You do. <laughs> but, you know, as my dad has said, turns out Pollyanna was right. Um, if, if we can just be mindful and, and intentional about 
choosing to focus on the positive, it changes everything. And we, we attract more of what we focus on. So focusing on the positive tends to bring more of that positivity to our lives. Yeah, one of my examples of, of that kind of positivity is a guy named William Howard III. And he liked to be called T. That's what, that's what we called him. And I remember uh, there was a time when um, T, because of a variety of physical and emotional problems, was held in the state mental hospital. And we would go visit T every Saturday um, on our weekend. We'd go pay him a visit. And we'd have to go through these security checks and a metal detector. And then that walk you down through several security stages to, to his unit where um, they would call for him. He would come out and, and T had a muscular dystrophy. So little by little, his muscles were failing him. And, um, and he was at this point in his life confined to a wheelchair. So he came out being pushed in his wheelchair and, and his body didn't work quite right. He couldn't walk. And uh, there were a lot of things he couldn't do, but I remember as he was being pushed out and he met me and Nancy and it was our custom to go to T and put our arms around him and bend, bend over him and hug him. And uh, I asked him, I said, so how are you T? And he said, uh, with some real reflection, he said, um, you know, Wally, I can breathe. And it just doesn't get any better than that. And I thought, oh man, oh man. When was the last time I was consciously grateful for the ability to breathe? When was the last time I just sat down and said, man, I love breathing. I love it. Now, part of the great education and maybe the irony for us was that um, maybe a year later, uh, T got pneumonia. And for someone who has muscular dystrophy, that's a death sentence because they can't clear their lungs properly. They took him to the hospital and worked on him. And he died, which makes all the more poignant his statement, um, I can breathe. And it just doesn't get any better than that. So sometimes when uh, we're frustrated about one thing or another, we think, yeah, yeah, but, you know, we can breathe. And, um, and we play with Andy's kids, too. We <laughs> play with his, his cute kids. We should have them all come in here and introduce themselves. But... Uh, then we wouldn't get anything else done, would we? That's right. So, <laughs> now I wish we were in a room together because at this point I'd love to pause and say, uh, what questions do you have? And if uh, you have some and you want to put them into the chat box, we'll have Andy monitor those and um, and try to respond to questions or comments that you have along the way. Uh, otherwise, let's turn to number two and uh, talk about happiness principle number two. We've said that the first is to savor the day, to enjoy the day and the things you're doing, to, to notice them and cherish them and make a record of them. Number two is um, focus on the positives in your past. And, and I thought if you were um, choosing a theme for your life story, would you say it was more an adventure, a tragedy, a war, a comedy? I thought the um, series of unfortunate events might be a, might resonate with some people that would say, you know, my life's been uh, quite a mess, and uh, things just keep falling apart. Um, I, I hope that's not the one you resonate with most. Maybe there are weeks like that, but I hope that's not the DVD of your entire life. But if you want to focus on the positives in your past, um, one is to deliberately choose a theme for your story. Um, I think of the, the children in Kauai, Hawaii, who, um, uh, according to the researcher, Emmy Werner, they had so many risk factors that they were virtually guaranteed to fail in life, fail in relationships, fail in school, fail in their careers. But a third of them did not. A third of them did not fail. They chose to write a different story. They were what she calls resilient. So they took a set of hard circumstances and they created a very positive story by turning them into something really good. So, so it isn't um, the circumstances themselves that really shape our lives. Rather, it is our response to them, the way we make sense of them. And um, especially in a world where uh, war and deprivation are fairly common, um, learning how to, to make sense of our life stories is really 
important. One, one important way of doing this is to keep some kind of record. And whether it's a record of blessings or whatever it is, however you choose to do that, Every once in a while, I try to do a year summary, a year review, and I go through my calendar in which I've written down what I did every day for the previous year. I go through the calendar and I summarize it, and it always takes my breath away. I think, oh my, look at what a magnificent life we have. Look at the things that have come together in the course of a year. And I'll bet you if you were to go back one year or two years or three years, and, and look at uh, how much things have changed, I think you'd be surprised. Now, I, I don't want to be a broken record, but I would say that if you keep records, that it's easier to do that. And I don't recommend that you do more than is useful to you. I just make a little notation every day, about 20 to 30 words every day on a calendar of what happened that day. And uh, when you go back and uh, skim those, oh my, what an amazing uh, combination of events that move our lives forward as long as we have, a, have a, that forward thrust, that view of where we want to go with our lives. So making a record. Anything you want to say about that, Andy? I've had the same experience. Um, <clears throat> my, uh, my mom, uh, her love language is, uh, you know, words of affection and and uh, letters. So when dad makes a record, he gives this letter, you know, that's a summary of the past year's blessings to my mom as a Christmas present. And um, I think for at least 15 years, that's been her favorite present each year. And so I've started doing that with Natalie and the exact same experience. It's absolutely breathtaking for me and I think for Natalie as, as we count the blessings from the past year um, just to to see it all in perspective and the gratitude is um, it's overwhelming. So really grateful for that um, example that you've said and the blessing that's been in our lives. Yeah. I, I assume that Nancy as a healthy adult would want uh, to have stacks of Christmas presents, but what she really wants is that letter in which we talk about the way our lives have just been blessed and move forward in the course of the previous year. So it's pretty powerful. There's another thing that um, is that psychology has found to be very, very potent. And that is to write a gratitude letter. So you identify someone who's made a very positive difference in your life. And they may at this point be alive or they may, have, may, they may be dead. But it doesn't matter. What matters is that you sit down and write a letter expressing what they did and how it changed your life. So for instance, I think of my fifth grade teacher, Rhea Bailey. I don't know for sure what she did, but I knew that Rhea Bailey loved me. I just knew she did. And it wasn't because she treated me better than other kids. She seemed to treat everyone well. But wow, it was just so amazing that she loved me. She treated me so well. And she. And then at the end of the of fifth grade, she uh, wrote me a little letter just in her own handwriting on a half sheet of paper a note about uh, what she expected of me. And wow, I still have that. And I love it. It's one of my most cherished possessions. Well, so imagine that I sit down and write a letter to Rhea Bailey. Now, Rhea Bailey died some years ago. But imagine that I write a letter and I say, Mrs. Bailey, thank you. Thank you for being encouraging. Thank you for the ways you loved and lifted that little boy. Thank you for lifting, looking beyond my mischief. Thank you for all of that. And Let's imagine I wrote that letter and literally wrote or typed that letter. And, and then in, in an ideal situation, you might make an appointment to see that person and, um, and show up on their door and read them the letter you have written. And research says that um, that will make a, an enduring change in your level of well-being. Uh, it's a simple thing. It might take an hour or maybe two at the most but if you want for the next months of your life to feel like, wow, my life is good, my life is satisfying, then uh, writing a gratitude letter is a really valuable thing to do. Again, I invite any of you to put any comments or questions in the chat box. Anything, anything you want to add, Andy? No, nope. or feel free to unmute yourself too if you want to speak your 
thoughts or questions? I just wanted to say it's so beautiful. I love that idea of the record, Wally. That is so beautiful. Yeah. You know, just and that you gift it to your beloved. And then now Andy's doing it. I looked at Paul straight away and I said, oh, we should do that. <laughs> it's just it's so beautiful. I want to just share that with the whole world. What a gorgeous idea. And imagine doing that for our children as well. You know, I just, I really love it. Thank you. That was, I love everything you've said, but that was such a precious gift for me because I'm doing the gratitude and, you know, all of that, but I've never thought to do a record like that. That's, I love it. Thank you. Yeah. And, and you know, Vanessa, it has amazed us when we, when I scan the previous year, just how much has happened and how rich it is, what the, you know, the places we've been, the things we've experienced. Um, there's a real richness to our lives that um, that we often miss it, unless we're really paying attention and making a record. Yeah, gorgeous. Thank you. Truly. I have a story that a friend shared with me. Let me let me give you the highlights of this story. Um, our friend, a woman named Barbara, um, we really admired and loved her dad, and her dad. Um, in fact, I'll read part of this story. He says, my dad's mom walked out on him when he was two years old, took his three siblings, but not him. And in spite of living only 30 minutes away, his entire childhood never made any effort to get to know him. His father didn't know how to care for him, so packed him up and took him to an orphanage, which is where he grew up 20 kids to a room and no loving adult to have one-on-one -on -one relationships with. So Barbara tells about her dad and about having a, some success in business, but really some hardships too. He uh, got a rare form of cancer and went blind and he was, on, he was taking dialysis for failed kidneys. And he just was suffering so much, especially in later life. And so um, Barbara once took him to some medical appointments and afterwards she said to her dad, she said, Dad, you just can't catch a break, can you? You just can't catch a break. She says that the next day her phone rang, and it was her dad. And he said, I've been thinking about what you said, and I wanted to let you know, I disagree. I disagree with you. I married my best friend, and to this day, she is still my very best friend. I have two daughters and three grandchildren who make me proud every day. I have wonderful friends. I was able to go farther in my career than I ever dreamed I could. I've done everything that was important to me to do. I've had a good time along the way. I consider myself to be a very lucky man, and I always have. So can you see, if we went back to that, um, that DVD um, that he was creating for his life, it might be a very lucky man. And it doesn't take away the fact that he suffered from cancer and kidney failure and spent untold hours on dialysis machines and lost his eyesight and his, uh, he lost virtually every capacity, but he felt enormously blessed. And so that really is um, the way we choose to make sense of our life histories. Do we choose to see um, just random messiness? Do we choose to see that everything inspires against us? Or do we choose to see ourselves as resilient, as capable, as blessed, as fortunate? Um, that's, um, if, if, if you want to know idea number two, one is to savor each day, two is to savor the past, to keep some kind of record of the past and um, use that record to create a story, a story that truly convinces us that our lives are extraordinary. Anything you want to add to that, Andy? No, nope, love it. Okay, why don't we go to point number three. Now, in these first three points, there's a common theme, and that theme is savoring. We savor the present, we savor the past. I'll bet you can guess what the next one is. We um, savor the future. We look forward to tomorrow. Um, and. And we live in a time when um, some would say that's, that's not easy. We live in a time when uh, 
Now, I, I don't know if it's just as bad in Australia as it is in the United States, but here, um, the media keep us fearful that every day we'll be eaten by sharks, even if we live in the mountains, you know, or that um, next earthquake is going to get us, or um, the tick fever is going to get us all, or that a terrorist is going to come to our house and destroy us all. I mean, the media has just an unending um, uh, litany of tragedies. And uh, so the mood of our time becomes dread, fear, and anxiety. And I love, there's a guy named Daniel Gardner. He's written a book called The Science of Fear. And if you're a person who's interested in how fear holds us hostage, you might want to, um, you might want to look at Daniel Gardner's book. Um, he, he talks about several things. One of them, let me, let me give you an example. He says a lot of parents, now this, again, this is, I don't know if it's as true in Australia as in the United States, but here, a lot of parents say, you know, these days you can't even let your children play outside because they'll be abducted by strangers. Um, well, the scientists who gather data on that say that the probability that a child will be abducted by a true stranger is so small that they consider it to be essentially zero. They call it de minimis, uh, essentially zero. That it does happen, and when it happens, everybody in the world hears about it. But almost all of uh, child disappearances involve an angry ex-spouse. And so if uh, you happen to know where your ex-spouse is, or you don't have an ex-spouse, or you're not angry with them, um, for you to spend very much time worrying about your child being abducted is almost surely a waste of your time. Um, there are lots of other things like we worry about flying, at least some people do. And the fact is if you drove the same number of miles in a car, you'd be about five times as likely to uh, die as in an airplane. Um, so, so there are any number of things. Uh, uh, various cancers people worry about and you may or may not know that the commonest cause of cancer is age so if you want to avoid cancer die when you're about two years old and you can avoid almost all cancer um that's not a remedy that i'm quite comfortable with i uh i've been willing to take my chances and i wouldn't mind living in some more years and tormenting your kids andy and just so hanging good. out with you guys you know so um now, there, of course, there are other things we can do that accelerate cancer, like smoking is chief among them. If you were to drink pesticide, that might really be uh, bad for your health as well. But if you had to say, am I so determined to avoid cancer that I'd be willing to die young to avoid it? I'd say, no, no, that's silly. No, I'll take my chances. And uh, with today's um, various resources available to us, various natural and, and uh, medical remedies. You know what? We stand much better chance than ever of surviving cancer. So uh, we look forward to tomorrow. We, um, instead of living with anxiety, we, we live with hope. Um, one of my favorite sayings that my grandpa had, he, he used to say, an optimist is a person who can have fun, thinking how much fun he'd be having if he were having fun. Um, so see, optimism or cheerfulness or happiness is to some extent a choice. We choose to say, oh man, life is good. Life is good. Um, so we um, look forward to tomorrow. Anything you want to add about that, Andy? Um, I think it's the reason that we put so much focus on creating vision boards and, mm -hmm. and really feeling into those, uh, you know, those, those future experiences, um, whether it's a rank goal or an, an income goal or touching X number of lives. Um, we, you know, we really encourage people to, to live into the future that they desire. Um, and, and it works. That's, that's why we, we focus on it so much. It's, it's a simple but powerful principle. Mm -hmm. Daniel Gardner, the, um, the uh, author who I cited earlier, observes that um, though 
the prevailing mood of our time is anxiety, there simply has never been a better time to be alive. There never has. In all of recorded history, there's never been a better time. He tells that in, um, in some ancient cultures, when you disagree with a neighbor, neighbor city, you just uh, gather up your weapons at night and go and kill them all. And I don't know about uh, Australia, but that doesn't happen much in the U.S. anymore. I hope it doesn't happen in Australia. Um, you know, we just, um, we just don't go around destroying other villages. Now, okay, there are traffic accidents and there are various maladies, um, but uh, it's worth remembering that on every front, in terms of conveniences, in terms of wealth, in terms of quality of life, in terms of health and well-being, there has never been a better time to be alive. And so to allow uh, dread and anxiety to prevail is just simply um, a tragedy. So should we look at happiness principle number four? Yep. Okay. I, I don't know um, if the self-esteem movement caught hold in Australia like it did in, in America. We do a lot of silly things that really make fools of us, and we, we like to look foolish. And so uh, we jumped on the self-esteem bandwagon and um, made, made it seem as if job one in all of life was to convince yourself that you're good enough, you're smart enough, and gee whiz, people like you. And um, we just assumed that uh, you couldn't really be happy until you did that. Well, turns out that, um, that self-esteem is not unitary it isn't just a single thing. Rather, we have a whole diversity of strengths and knowing what they are is really important. And um, just a side note, I've listed the 24 strengths identified by a group of psychologists as being valued in human societies across history. So they looked at historical records and they said, what things have been valued? What things really are important to humans? What qualities are, are vital? What qualities of character make a difference? And, and they've identified 24 of them that, have, um, that have, have manifest themselves as important across, across historical time. And those uh, 24 on your screen, they also are in the workbook that Andy described. So um, the 24 are listed and are also, uh, there's a short question that asks you about each of them so you can, in a, in a quick way, evaluate whether that's one of your strengths. And then at the bottom of your page, at the bottom of the screen, there should be a, it should say VIA survey of character strengths at authentichappiness.org. That web address is also provided in the booklet and it's shown there. At authentichappiness.org, you can take a 240 item instrument and answer those 240 items. And it'll tell you of these 24 strengths, which are your top five? Which are your top five strengths? Um, boy, it is so important to know our strengths. I, I don't know if any of you have made the, the serious and miserable mistake that I have made of being so focused on my weaknesses, thinking that I could somehow torture myself into overcoming them, that I kept myself held hostage for uh, decades. And I love what Martin Seligman says. He says on page 13 of his book, Authentic Happiness, he says, I do not believe you should invest overly much energy in overcoming your weaknesses. Now let's pause and let that thing sink in. I do not believe you should invest overly much energy in overcoming your weaknesses. Rather, your greatest satisfaction in life and your greatest productivity will come from knowing and using your strengths. He says your signature strengths, those top five, those things in which you excel. And so a wise, a wise uh, manager knows what his or her strengths are and then surrounds him or herself with people who bring strengths in other areas. And you know, the nice thing about people with different strengths is they irritate the heck out of us. They make us crazy, don't they? When someone has a strength that's the opposite of yours, you just think, why don't, why don't you shape up and be like me? And, um, and the reality is that when we surround ourselves with people with different strengths, uh, we really are more likely to be effective. So there are the 24 strengths. And um, 
And I, I, uh, I encourage you to take that test. Uh, and if you only take one, maybe it isn't the first one you take. Maybe it's the strengths finder. But you can take many and they'll give you different data. Like this will give you data about your strengths. And we sometimes in our, in our university faculty, we had um, every faculty member take the survey of character strengths. And then we charted the strengths and we said, okay, which strengths do we have in abundance in our faculty and which ones are absent? And um, then, we, then we say, oh, that's why we don't get such and such done in our department. Because there's nobody who does this. There's nobody who's strong at that. And then you see what strengths you have in abundance and you say, okay, that's why that's so easy for us. And um, it's really a good way to improve your productivity and to also um, improve your well-being. And do you want to say something about uh, Strengths Finder? Yeah, we've just been blown away um, ever since we, we took the Strengths Finder test um, about nine years ago by how, um, how powerful that is when we come from a space of, of knowing and playing and serving in our strengths. <clears throat> um, and, you know, doTERRA is obviously a relationship business. And so the better we can learn how to work with each other and draw on those strengths and recognize strengths in others and, and collaborate, the further we'll go. Um, so <clears throat> just to give you an example, um, we, we actually took the Strengths Finder test as a double date with Laura and Jerry Jacobs. Uh, it was Jerry who um, said, we got to do this, guys. This is fantastic. So <clears throat> we found out from the, the Strengths Finder test that Natalie's first and primary strength is strategy, and Laura's first strength is uh, command, and um, oh, there's another one like activator. It's about getting things done. And so what they found out, and they, they confirmed it with their, all their experience together, is that Laura, um, without strategy, can go quite a ways down a road um, and, and plow a lot of energy into a project without knowing why she's doing it or, or what the desired outcome is. <clears throat> but when she's partners with Natalie, <clears throat> look out. She <clears throat> can go far and, and make magic happen. So uh, just to give some examples, um, <clears throat> with, with her team, uh, she, she checks in with us every couple months and says, okay, Natalie, I'm spinning my wheels. Um, we're not going anywhere. It's time for another strategy session. And so they'll come and they'll, they'll put their heads together and they can absolutely make um, new ranks and new projects and, and massive growth happen. So um, that's just one example of how knowing our strengths helps us uh, to move forward uh, in such productive ways. Um, another example is um, <clears throat> when we're coaching and mentoring our team members, if we know our strengths and we also know their strengths, <clears throat> we can know um, how to speak to what they're best at and, and how to leverage, help them leverage their strengths in their doTERRA business. So um, we just purchased um, the strengths cards from Jeremy Breckheisen's um, company, Gallup. And every mentoring session we do now, we make sure that we know the people's strengths in advance. And then we hold up these, these cards and we, um, ah, yes, there you go. Paul is, is holding them up. Let's see if I can give him the screen. I was just looking for mine. Yep, theme insights. This is what they're called. So you can buy them at gallup.com. Just click on shop. And um, it's a really, really simple tool. The three areas on those cards that we like to focus on is the I am, the I need, and I bring, or I contribute. Um, those three are super useful when we think about, you know, what, what, where do you find meaning and purpose in, your, in the way that you show up in doTERRA? Uh, what's going to be the best way for you to uh, to serve you and your team members. So um, 
Strengths Finder is, you know, one of the many tools that has been really powerful for us. Um, just, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, we were on a webinar with Jeremy and, and with Adisan Santoshi. And we had some great breakthroughs that we got to dive in deeper on this trip last week to Africa with Adisan Santoshi. And so just such a, a huge gift as we come to know and celebrate our strengths, um, it just shifts our ability not only to serve, but also to, to find joy in the process. So Martin Seligman nailed it and uh, we're, we're confirming it every day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really makes a difference. It's yeah. really practical. I think about um, when I was in college, uh, I was a guy who loved to create uh, various forms of mischief, you know, like put touch explosives on the neighbor girl's doorsteps so that when we walk up down the stairs, there would be little explosions and clouds of purple smoke. And it was very satisfying. Maybe sometime we'll have a workshop on that. But, but then I'd go to my university classes and I had a professor named J.R. Balaf who was so dignified and he was kind and he was intelligent and I just loved Jay Balaf and I'd watch Jay Balaf and I'd think, why can't I be like that? Why do I have to be an idiot? Why do I have to be a goofball? Why can't I be like J.R. Balaf? And I'm afraid that's um, something we tend to do is we tend to look at other people's gifts and then we stop valuing our own. And one of the things I um, have learned from the VIA survey of character strengths is my consistently, my number one strength is creativity. And, and uh, wow, it, it, I see now how in my career, when I led with the creativity and, and worked with other people who could balance that, I was a lot more productive than when I tried to make myself into Jay Balaf. Um, I could imagine that Jay Balaf at the university could have a wonderful, could organize a wonderful graduation and it'd be very dignified. But if you want to have a party afterwards, you better put Wally in charge of that. Otherwise, you'll be sitting around just having a lecture on physics. So anyway, that's um, number four. Know and use your strengths and then help other people do that and so that you combine your strengths and you use your strengths with other people's strengths. And that's that story of, uh, of Natalie uh, is a great one, isn't it? And of course it matters in marriage too. We have different strengths in our, um, in our couple relationships and we can make each other crazy or we can um, build strength. So why don't we look at uh, principle number five, shall we Andy? Let's do it. And um, again, that, that link, that URL um, appears in the publication if you are interested in going to authentichappiness.org or some of you may have already made a note and have that down. Principle number five um, is uh, choose to serve. Choose to serve. Now Seligman, who really uh, organized a lot of these discoveries about personal well-being, the, there are these five things. The first three are savoring. The next one is knowing and using your strengths. And the final one is choose to serve. When we take our strengths and use them to make the world a better place or make the world that we care about, the people we care about, <clears throat> when we choose to make life better for them, it adds a richness to our lives that you can't find in any other way. And uh, Andy, why don't you tell about your Africa experience? Yeah. Um... So I've dreamt my whole life of going to Africa and uh, Natalie and I um, actually share the same dream. We've, we've talked about it and, and thought how cool it would be, but it always seemed um, out of reach and it just felt like, you know, Africa represents this huge challenge um, that nobody's really been able to crack, right? How, how do we help and serve this continent? with so much need and, and so much um, poverty, so much corruption. I mean, there's so many strikes, uh, massive disease and starvation. And I mean, gosh, you name the, the problem and Africa's got it. <clears throat> so we've had this desire to, to go and serve there, um, but it wasn't until doTERRA came along that, that the door was open. So earlier this year when doTERRA announced this co-impact sourcing trip. Um, without even thinking about it, we looked at each other and said, we're in, we're, we're going to Kenya. 
So uh, we hopped on a plane last week, and uh, luckily my parents were willing to watch the, the littles and chase six kids for the week. <laughs> it so, was great. Super grateful for them. Um, but as, as many of you know, doTERRA is, um, is committed not only in principle, but also in action to, to lifting all of humanity. And we, you know, we do this not just through charity, but by, by offering the dignity that comes with uh, providing work and providing a way for people to, uh, to have honest work and to have a way to provide for their family and even to create um, security of their own that, that wasn't available before. So, you know, we, we did a lot of humanitarian work. We, we painted some schools. Uh, we did, um, we, we uh, dedicated a new water well with the ribbon cutting and we, um, we did some planting and reforestation. We taught some, um, the girls about um, feminine hygiene. And you know, overall, that that humanitarian work, where it's it's primarily kind of a one-time gift, it was beautiful and it was it was powerful. Um, but the thing that touched me the most was when I discovered the way DoTerra is um, is is offering sovereignty to these beautiful people. Um, if, if you were to survey all the farmers in Kenya and ask them if they own their own land, 99% would say no. And if you were to find out how many of them have the possibility of ever owning a land, most of them would say never. Uh, but doTERRA comes in and they, um, you know, they could easily take their profits and just acquire massive um, amounts of land and farming and, and, and equipment and just build a real empire over there. You know, it's, it's uh, similar to the traces of, of imperialism that we saw everywhere we went. Um, but doTERRA does the exact opposite. Uh, what they do is they, they, they go in and they look for ways to help these farmers buy their own land. And, and they, they've set up uh, partnerships with the local government um, to, to find out who the local owners are. Many times the farmers are just squatting. And so first they identify the owner and then they create terms and then they allow a way for the farmers to buy this land. And for most of these farmers, this is the first time they've ever owned their own land or their own home. And as, um, as I walked away from this, um, this village in Kenya, where we walked into the farmers' homes and we walked the fields with them, um, it, it struck me for the first time um, what, what a gift that is and, and what a, a huge service that we can do. Um, and, and, you know, we, we all love the oils that these farms are growing and they love us for bringing a steady demand for their product. And so the, the connection that we share, you know, as Natalie and I have traveled to Haiti, and as I've gone to Nepal and, and to Guatemala and met with these growers and felt the, the mutual gratitude that we have for each other. You know, we, we try to work uh, maybe a half day's work out in the scorching sun in Kenya, and, and we're ready to collapse and need about a week to recover. And, and this is their everyday grind day in and day out. But, but we come to these beautiful people with just so much gratitude for the gifts that they're bringing to us. And when we were in, a, in a Haiti, um, there was a, the head there, um, George, was trying to express his gratitude to us for what we bring. And as he stood up to speak, he doubled over and wept for five minutes straight and could not say a single word because the gratitude that he felt. And so um, to the whole phrase, you know, the, the, the co-impact sourcing just took on a whole new depth of meaning for me um, as I learned how we may 
be getting a better product and we may be, um, you know, increasing our supply chain, but we're also bringing so many gifts and so many blessings to the people that we're working with. And um, it changed us as Natalie and I got to uh, connect and serve these beautiful people of Kenya. Um, we left a uh, changed people. So yeah. service, um, it works. It, it, makes, it makes us happy and, and brings meaning to the work that we do. You know, sometimes we can think of service as a, as a duty and obligation and a burden. We can also think of it as an opportunity and a blessing. And uh, when we dedicate some chunk of our lives to making life better for people we care about, it makes a difference. I had a great experience uh, a couple weeks ago when uh, we were attending a, a workshop and the, the workshop leader said, uh, okay, I want you to go out to lunch and after you have your lunch, I want you to go make a meaningful difference for somebody. And we were all having this perplexed look like uh, meaningful difference, uh, just out of the blue with someone we don't know. And uh, that didn't quite make sense to us. And he said, uh, don't worry about it. He said, you go looking for an opportunity and you will run into them. They are already on their way. They are ready for you to show up and help them. Anytime you tune your heart to a willingness to help, the person will show up, they'll be there. And uh, boy, it was just amazing because Nancy and I went to Walmart and uh, we were looking around for an opportunity to help someone. And there was a young mama with a baby in her um, shopping cart and three little girls along with her. And it didn't look like they had very much. And uh, anticipating this opportunity, we'd filled our pockets with some toys. So we got down and started handing toys to the to these little girls and it was really fun because the little the one about two or three years old who just was big eyed and she came up to me and put her hand in my pocket because she figured that there must be an unlimited supply of toys in my pocket. And, um, and so Nancy talked to this good woman and uh, loved on her while I went to the checkout counter and bought a gift card for her. And by the time I got back, these two women were hugging and crying and uh, wow. All we did was set out to, with an intent to find someone who we could help. And uh, there they were. There she was with her, her four children. And uh, what a blessing that was. And um, what we're talking about here is not just good practices. These are practices that actually make us happier. And with that, they make us more productive. Isn't that a, an extraordinary combination? that in the process of being more productive, we are also more happy. So uh, th these are the five keys and those, um, they're as good as summary. Um, I mean, we could, um, on another time, we could talk about the relationship issues because relationships also add so much to the quality of our lives. But um, these are the five keys. The first three of them are all about savoring, savoring the present, savoring the past, savoring the future, using our strengths, and then serving, those those are the big five, and what a difference they make. Um, Got a question come in. Um, for some people, uh, serving is not something that comes naturally. Um, so, what do you suggest for inspiring? First, the desire, and and you know the the actual service. Um, that's a great question. I I my first thought is that. Um, there are so many ways to serve that I think, I think no one here should try to serve just like someone else. Like trying to be an Andy is a guarantee for frustration, just as being a J.R. Balif was for me. I think to say, okay, here are the strengths I have. Like my, my dear wife, Nancy, the sweetest woman I've ever known. Um, Nancy, um, when she enters a room, she instinctively notices who's alone and she is just drawn to them. She herself is an introvert, a quiet person. She doesn't want to find the crowd and she doesn't want to make any noise. She just wants to find somebody with whom she can connect, with whom she can bond. And uh, she's Im immensely successful at it. So I guess my suggestion is 
first, know what your strengths are. And, and second, um, don't try to be someone else, but try to use your strengths to serve in the way that's right for you. Um, what, what would you add, Andy? Boy, um, I, you know, if, if, if they don't even have the desire to serve, I wonder if dropping first into the, the gratitude for the way they've been served um, is, is maybe uh, a, a good first step. Yeah. Um, so, so taking people through gratitude exercises um, could be a way to um, inspire service. Maybe to acknowledge who has served them. Yeah. As we're aware of um, our debts to people around us, we may be more ready to serve others. Yeah, yeah. so getting at the desire piece. Um, and then I guess the other part I'm suggesting is don't try to do things you're not good at because sometimes we, we're sure we're going to fail. Um, Jody observes that uh, the holidays are a great time for this, that um, there are a, a lot of expectations of happiness that aren't readily met by people's realities. Mm -hmm. And if we uh, look around us, we'll find somebody who could use maybe it's an invitation to a meal or maybe it's some gifts or word of encouragement. Yep. Thanks, Jody. Any other questions, comments? Feel free to type them or unmute yourself. Right. Well, um, I'll be posting the, um, the PDF of your blueprint happiness, your blueprint for happiness at sharesuccess.com forward slash Australia. Um, so feel free to go uh, grab that download there. Um, it's a great resource. Um, there's also um, an email list that you can sign up for. Um, and I'll put a link to the email uh, list as well. What's the list called? Um, it's Navigating Life's Journey. Navigating Life's Journey. So it's just a, a series of really simple, short um, nuggets uh, to help you along your, your journey towards joy. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dad, for sharing your, uh, your wisdom and your, your experience and, and um, I mean, this represents literally decades of, of personal as well as collective research in the field of positive psychology. So um, we wish the very best to you in your journey on the, the path to joy. Thank you so much for, for your commitment to what you do to lift others and to serve the world. We love you all and look forward to connecting again soon. Good to be with you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. You're on mute, are you?